Hey everyone, so this is how it's going to work. So we have nine, sorry, two people added at the last minute. So we have nine people who are going to briefly talk about papers they like. And what's going to happen at the end is that we're going to sort of vote and select a few of these to be presented later in our normal sessions. So the idea here is not to go into depth of these papers. The idea is just to sort of very high level introduce the idea so that we can have a you know community vote if you like uh, and based on that decide what papers to to look at in our regular sessions um, and <laughs> yeah awesome okay cool so uh, I'm going to I was supposed to present an abstract myself but I was too lazy or busy I guess uh, so I'm going to do a plug instead sorry can you go to the next slide Oh, all right. So here's my plug. <laughs> uh, so as you know, we run technical hands-on workshops on Thursdays. Uh, right now, we are running the mathematics of deep learning. And the next workshop is going to be uh, on GANs. And Andrew is awesome. He's, he's going to teach that course. Uh, it is three weeks, intense, hands-on. You know, you can get as much as you want out of it sort of thing. You can attend in person or online. Depending on your situations, you can pick whatever works for you. Uh, and we have, you know, we have the early bird discount going on, but you all have your personalized discounts. So check whichever is higher. Well, definitely your personalized discount is higher. So use that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, come talk to me. Uh, and otherwise, register. Every week, the price goes up. So Wednesday, the price will go up. So register as soon as you want, or can, rather. Uh, can I say something? Yeah. I hear myself. Okay. Uh, I just want to say um, we're trying to make this. Uh, it's not very We're trying to make this. We're trying to make this more, more than a, about just GANs because um, for for the regular GANs you have GAN, psycho GAN, uh, but we try to make uh, a few more module about adversarial training and learning because I think that part is actually um, an extension of what you can actually do with it, other than just generating fake uh, 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 fake photos. So it's not guaranteed, but I'm, we're working with Andrew to work on that. Yeah, so the general idea of all the workshops that we do is to make them applied and relevant. So you would be walking out of the workshop with you know, a very basic application, but it is something that does something uh, rather than covering theory and all. So what we're going to do now is to go through the slides one by one. If you see your name, come up here, grab this, and start talking for five minutes. We're not going to stop you, but you know, try to wrap it up in five minutes. Don't go into too much detail, just very high level. And the audience is welcome to ask questions. Uh, but if you think your question, even asking the question is going to go more than 10 seconds, that's probably not a good question for this session because we don't want to go into details. Uh, but you know, if there is something that you can quickly clarify, go ahead and do it. Uh, otherwise, you know, we'll have a break. We can talk about, like, you can go up to people who talked and talk to them some more. And hopefully in the future, we will set up to, to present them in detail. All right, so the first one is, ta -da. all right, this goes on your right side. That's it? That's left. Okay. <laughs> I thought it's your left. <laughs> no, you're right. All right, you're on. OK. Uh... Good evening, everyone. My name is Owen. I am an IT developer, a big data developer. So today I'm going to uh, introduce a paper that uh, very interesting, at least for myself. Uh, the name of the paper is Video Action Transformer Network. It's basically a paper that, uh, you know, the author is Rohit uh, from uh, Carnegie Mellon University and some of the people from uh, Google DeepMind and uh, University of Oxford. So the paper is about action uh, recognition. So which means that uh, action recognition task is involving identification of uh, different actions of video clips. So uh, usually you uh, create a sequence of 2D frames from the videos and uh, 
where the action may or may not per, uh, be performed throughout the entire duration of the video. So that's uh, what uh, the video action here means. So action recognition pass from the video. And it's a quite a challenging for, uh, you know, a model to be able to recognize uh, human actions because uh, it's not only that requir requires understanding of the people, but also understanding objects surrounding them. Like if you are uh, the action is listening to someone, so you are not just focusing on that someone, but you have to also uh, focus on the other people, uh, the, uh, the one that you are listening to, right? So like pointing to an, to an object, for example, too. So you are not just focusing on the person, but you have to know that the person is really pointing to a something. So uh, this means require reasoning jointly about the person and the animate and inanimate elements of their surroundings. So uh, the, the the model uh, they 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 tr they come out with a model that can determine and utilize such contextual information, the people and other surrounding objects. So that's why they come out with the transformer architecture that we all know is that very quite famous for uh, sequence. Uh, uh, analy an analysis. So this is one of the suitable model since it explicitly builds contextual support for its representation using self-attention. So they use these two components, they call it uh, uh, for the spatial temporal I3D model, which is the 3D CNN. That's a 3D CNN model I think comes uh, built by Google, DeepMinds. Uh, DeepMinds. And then uh, an RPN, a uh, region proposal network. With the combination of the two, uh, they, they generate a query that input to the transformer head that aggregates contextual information from the, uh, from the people and the objects in the videos. So uh, the, the result of the paper itself is an improvement, uh, state of the art at that point of time, uh, an improve of 17%. Up, uh, so they managed to get into 25% MAP, so mean average, uh, mean uh, average precision. 25% so is small, but that's the best so far uh, for the state of the art. So before that is below 20%. So, and also one thing uh, good about this uh, implementation is that they just use RGB frames, raw RGB frames, no need for optical flow, which is usually is very, very, you know, time consuming works to uh, do uh, videos or image pre-processing. Thank you. If you're on this side of the room, you might be shown in the video. You might want to be famous, otherwise we'll see. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this uh, paper, Focal Laws for Dense Object Detection. Um, first, a bit of background. So what is object detection? It's basically the problem that is addressed by the uh, branch of artificial intelligence that is a uh, computer vision that basically deals with the task of uh, identifying objects in an image. Uh, we can appreciate uh, that one of the most uh, critical applications of this uh, technique is, for instance, a pedestrian recognition, sorry, pedestrian detection system for a driveless car application, for instance, where a uh, bounding boxes uh, pinpoints the, ob the object of our interest. In this case, <laughs> in this case, uh, the pedestrian. 
So this uh, paper by uh, Jean Erdahl uh, proposes a new method for image object uh, detection uh, implemented in an application called RetinaNet. Uh, to further uh, talk about this application, uh, let's uh, talk about detectors. So detectors uh, come in two flavors. So the first is two-stage detectors, and these methods uh, provide high performance in terms of accuracy and process speed. In the first stage, sparse, sparse uh, proposals are generated, which may uh, potentially include uh, objects of interest. And the second stage sends regions of interest down the pipeline for object classific classification. Uh, proposed as background or foreground. So an RCNN or region-based convolutional neural network is able to leverage uh, this CNN for the second stage classification task and achieve even a higher accuracy in object detection. For first stage detectors, they treat the object detection as a simple regression problem by taking an input image and learning the class probabilities and bounding in box coordinates. These models reach lower accuracy rates but are much faster than two-stage detectors. The authors of this paper pose the question of why one-stage uh, detectors cannot perform as two-stage detectors. They answer this question by saying that the main cause in the class is the class imbalance between steam foreground and background in an image. To address uh, this situation, the authors propose the concept of focal loss that centers in training on a set on hard examples, avoiding that the majority of easy negatives overwhelms the detector during training. So basically, what they propose to address this class imbalance by downgrading the standard entropy loss of the well-classified examples. The authors claim that the retina net can match the processing speed of one-stage detectors and even exist, exceed the accuracy of two stage detectors. Thank you. Thank you. So hey everyone, um, I'm Albert and I'll be talking about two papers today. The first one I'll be talking about is the fashion GAN, uh, fashion synthesis with structural coherence. So the gist of this paper is basically, uh, let's just say you feed the model a picture of me wearing a t-shirt and jeans and you say a boy 
wearing a bright pink dress and high heels. And that's exactly what I'll give you. A picture of me, but rather than a shirt and jeans, uh, put me in a dress and give me some nice high heels. And it was actually very pre previously very difficult to do this because of a problem called coherence. So basically, the model could put on the, the clothing, but it would miss out on, for example, the pose, the shape of the person, and like the visibility of the body parts. And the way this, this model combats this problem is with a two-stage GAN. So the first stage takes what's called a semantic segmentation map. So when we feed it the picture, it takes that picture and extracts like the body shape and uh, what I look like and the visible body parts. And the next second stage GAN is the generator. And that's when it takes the wording of bright pink dress and high heels and parses the, the, the parses the words and what they mean and pair it along with the semantic segmentation map to get the final image. And the implications of this are, well, you don't need a fashion designer anymore. You can just see whatever clothes you want to wear, put them on, and see if you look good in them. And if not, well, there's millions of other combinations you can try. And Further work they propose on doing this is, for one, because the original model was only able to uh, change the clothes on the person. They were trying to see, hmm, what can we, what if we can change the background as well? So if you're standing in maybe just like a white space, it could add like a forest background. And this is pretty cool because now you don't have to walk into a shop anymore. You can just see what you want to wear and try it on. And the second paper I want to talk about what? Oh, okay. So I guess that's good enough for now. Yeah. Anyone has any short questions? No? Awesome. Okay. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. I read this paper about two hours ago. Let's see if I, how much I can remember. I scan it. So, and this came about, I think, um, when it, it just came out. I think it came out like really recently, like a week ago. And just by, like, I when I first took a glance at it, I'm like, I have no idea what this is talking about. And then it seems a lot of people are tweeting it and hyping it. So, so then you realize, okay, it is probably something important. Then we're like, okay, we're probably going to probably just take a look into it. So I scan this paper in the afternoon, then I'm here to report to, to you like what this paper is about. So, um, okay, how, uh, I, I just want to do a like, quick survey. How many, how many of you are, uh, know about how uh, autom automatic differentiation works? Oh, no money. Okay. Okay. So, um, it is really a. Uh, if you look at the authors of this paper, I probably can. Like the first author is from Julia Computing. Oh yeah, but the affiliation, Mike Ings, is from Julia Computing. Third author, Julia Computing, and Iliad, Julia Computing, and some from MIT, and which could probably give you a clue that this is really. My understanding, in, in my understanding, just a uh, very glorified and disguised um, advertisement for Julia and its ecosystem. Oh. <laughs> but okay, they, they, they do they do have some. Um, I guess they, 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 they have they do have this um, this thing called a um, uh, partial P, which is actually part of the title. You can probably see here, like this partial P. It's called like how do you say it? partial P, right? Yeah. This is for the camera. So uh, that's I guess the framework or whatever. Uh, it's a system that they call a system. But uh, after I scan through this paper, they do make a few very good points why you should use Julia. So I think it's worth. I, I in fact actually think this even though this is an introduction on like how 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 this system is 
created. It's not your typical machine learning paper, but it's, it's about like how we created this con all these constructs so that it's very easy for you to do machine learning and scientific computing. Uh, I think this paper actually deserves a um, full session uh, just to because it has a whole bunch of related concepts which are very important for us to understand uh, machine learning. One being auto automatic differentiation, and so I'm. Um, and the, the, so they made two points. I guess the two of the major takeaways I took from this paper that why you should care about Julia. So I'm, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm, 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 I'm gonna summarize to you. I think that they definitely have more points, but I think that those two points are actually legitimate and they're very good points. The first point is, if you think about how we um, make our deep learning algorithm, like, like implement our deep learning algorithms, it's mostly, um, our programs are fairly static in the sense that, well, the, the most, most typical example is like TensorFlow. So uh, TensorFlow 1.0, static graph all the way. Uh, so the, does, is everyone familiar with a static graph or? Okay, mostly, okay. So the, there's, a, there's a big assumption behind this, which is in machine learning tasks, the, uh, you, you can take a lot of time to, to prepare. Like in this, in this case, you compile a, a huge static graph. And in, for, in exchange for, for efficiency during the runtime, like while we are training it. So that, that's, the, that's a very, very big assumption. Uh, but as we progress uh, towards like uh, into different areas, like maybe it's a hybrid mixed problem, or maybe even if you progress into like the most latest trend of machine learning, a uh, static graph is no longer a valid assumption in a lot of the cases. Uh, if you, I can't think of like a very concrete example, but like if you can't, all like there's some of these like newest, the fanciest algorithms, they actually, um, their graph or their control flow actually is dependent on the estimation itself. So your, your graph could be no longer static. So it is because of that they argue that uh, Julia, like with our this what, partial P uh, programming framework, uh, we are you're able to easily achieve that. They have a few like good constructs, like basically a domain specific language. They, they they claim that okay, our construct is very flexible for you to achieve that goal. Uh, the other th a, a little background knowledge is that their argument is, um, and traditionally you you have like. Um, sort of two uh, two uh, groups of people. Uh, sorry, two. What is that word? Groups of people working. There's just uh, two communities. There's a scientific computing community and there's a machine learning community. They don't overlap that much, but it has increasingly become um, apparent that the two are sort of kind of merging. Uh, in what way? So the, the one of the most significant ways is that we started seeing some of those like. You probably start seeing those ti uh, paper titles about differentiable this and differentiable that. Like for example, differentiable physics simulator. So what is that for? And and then you have other all kinds of like differentiable simulators. So what what's the reason why you need to care about differentiable si simulators, which is traditionally probably within the realm of uh, scientific computing, because scientific computing is basically with a very little data, and we I just like explore large, vast amount of space. And uh, I find uh, I, with like brute force, like with a lot of computational power, I, 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 I found, discover some, something scientifically. But whereas like in machine learning, there's like a lot of data and we're, like machine learning is very data driven. But why do you care about simulation? Uh, s the reason is because simulation is cheap and you can sample data easily from simulation. So that's why you need to care about machine learning. However, Sampling or like they call like Monte Carlo approaches are usually very inefficient because you just, you just have to run the simulator and sample a lot of data points. So what's a good alternative? A good alternative is you plug in the simulator and you and your simulator is differentiable. So your entire system, like all the way from your machine learning model all the way to your uh, simulator, is end-to-end -end differentiable. So your gradient can actually get prop propagated back. So that, they argue, is actually a very much, much more efficient way of training your neural network algorithm. So back to why Julia, uh, Julia is superior in this aspect is because if you think about like PyTorch, TensorFlow, uh, on one hand, there's all, they all 
cluster uh, around this like uh, machine learning side. They don't care as much about simulation and um, the scientific computing. But on the other hand, you probably have I'm not really familiar with like scientific computing, but you have like probably other frameworks that, f that focus solely on s scientific computing. Whereas Julia a is a framework that sits right in the middle. It both has um, some usage in, in machine learning and other usage in um, scientific computing. So they to concretely, they give a few examples. I think two, two examples stood out. There's one on quantum uh, computing. I, I couldn't understand a single word. So I'm just going to skip that. Uh, so one, one, one example is computer vision. Uh, for example, um, we can think of computer vision as the inverse problem of rendering. So, so that, that's um, the, the way, like, so basically uh, the, the problem of a computer rendering or computer graphics is basically you already have the model, very precise model, and you want to render the real scene like apply lightning and all kinds of heuristics and, and to make it photorealistic. Whereas machine learning is like giving an image and you want to uh, do it backward, like you inversely try to infer the model. Or you can think of it that way. So uh, what if you have a differentiable renderer and that's plugged into your system. So you, you utilize the differential renderer as your simulator to generate as many images as you want. So number one is differentiable. And number two is, um, I think in their words, it, it's basically um, there is a lot of like heuristics and nuances that's actually being applied into the simulator that the, your machine learning model can in turn learn from. So that's, does that make sense? Okay. So that's one example. The other example they, they use is the, um, what is it called? In the financial sector, it's about money. Oh yeah, financial derivatives. So, um, in, in some, like, so if you think about like uh, predicting the prices of bonds and all that, it, it's really, it's operating on a, in an in a environment that you're not aware of. They're, they're not, if you're trying to uh, learn from that environment, there's, as a programmer, there's not much you can do other than like, okay, you have a few sample data, right? So how can we simulate that environment? One way they mentioned is a lot of financial contracts are composable and they are very similar to a programming language. So what if you have a financial contract programming language that is also end-to-end -end differentiable? So that, I don't know how like practical that is, but that, that is what this, um, this section, this paper claims. So uh, for, it, for all that reason, um, I think that is kind of like two, one, two of the biggest like rationale behind uh, this paper. So this paper itself is just an overview, um, a high-level overview of, of of the ecosystem and, and give a, a few code snippets and code examples and see exactly how you can um, apply this. Uh, it's worth mentioning because it, it is tied to a few things we have never covered in our community. So I think it's probably worth covering. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay, so has anyone seen this la large memory layer with product keys? Uh, I think it's ha um, how many how many people have uh, heard or um, heard about like XLNet? You have, you have. Okay. So this paper has not uh, th doesn't it, uh, it doesn't directly reference XLNet, but I will. T I'll tell you about like what I think why it is kind of related. This is a paper by Facebook. Uh, what they did is, oh, how many of you uh, know uh, Transformer? I think a lot. Of, okay, a lot of you already know Transformer. Um, so Transformer is this NLP uh, state of the art architecture. So you see all this like crazy related breakthrough such as Bird GPT-2 that is capable of generating fi like f fake news and all the like 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 the soup like like performances like all kinds of tasks that that surpass human level, that is all due to transformer, uh, partially due to transformer. So, um, then Bert is based on transformer. Bert is this model by Google. Uh, it ha it was the single model state of the art in the uh, 
and there's a context, ongoing context called Squad 2.0, where they had a whole bunch of like NLP tasks, such as question answering, and they have a leaderboard. So BERT and its variants, like basically, uh, like dominated the, the leaderboard until two weeks ago. So XLNet came along and claimed the fifth place, but you, you need to understand that uh, it's a single model as opposed to like all the ensemble models that was like uh, uh, above XLNet. So a single model performance XNL, XLNet right now is the top, is the state of the art. So, um, but what I found interesting in XLNet is in there's this, I, I scanned the paper and I think we're going to have a XLNet in aug, like a talk in August, right? Yeah, we're, we're going to have a talk in August. So, you, um, but there's one sentence that, that caught my attention, which is basically saying uh, their model is underfitting and uh, further training does not help with improving the model. Uh, the reason is because they're using a super large data set that has like, I forgot how many words, but this is a super large data set. And they suggest that it could be due to like, they have actually reached the model capacity. So, uh, so no, no further training does not improve. And so, which uh, comes to the question of how can you, uh, in, uh, if that is a bottleneck that we, maybe that's something that we have pre we're, we're previously not aware of, uh, how do we solve it? I think my understanding is that this could be a one answer. Uh, this gives, uh, so in a nutshell, what this memory layer does is it is almost like a like a plot like dropping replacement of the feed for uh, layer in the transformer. So in transformer you have uh, self attention like in each of those blo like blocks you have self attention and following self attention you have like feed for network uh, with like sh uh, shared weights. Uh, I, I, I forgot. But what they did is simply uh, take that part out and replace that with the large memory layers. Uh, this what they call large memory layers. I don't think they have a name. Yeah. So um, I have to admit, I don't fully, I, I tried twice to read the paper. I don't fully get it. Uh, so, but uh, what I can point out is they're using uh, a technique that kind of factorize the key. So, so, so in all those memory networks, you basically have a, like, like there's this concept of key and uh, given the key and you kind of try to, oh, sorry, you have this concept of query and given the, query and you have a bunch of key and you do dot query and key and you get your content. So that's kind of roughly how it works. Uh, the novelty for this paper is that they kind of break that key part into two parts so that uh, as a result, the search space becomes a much, much larger and it can, it is capable of holding a lot more content. So practically speaking, uh, the implication of that is they are able to, I think they they constructed like something like 24 layer transformer as their baseline. They're able to achieve uh, performance better than their baseline only with half of the layers and with half of the training time. So um, that is a very interesting fact. Um, I don't think itself this technique itself beats any of the state of the art because they didn't claim they will. But I think the timing is interesting because Google was working on Excel, a bird in XLNet. Uh, XLNet came out and then I, about a week or two weeks later, like this, th this paper came out. They are like two isolated groups of work. Like what if they just combine forces? So that, that's what I'm thinking. So the natural question, the, the biggest burning question for me is like, can this be applied to XLNet to even further uh, improve the results. So um, I think that's it. And and the I, I, if you were to look dig deep into the paper, they are using actually this uh, technique called pro product quantization. If anyone has heard of that, and that is actually a very popular paper, um, earlier popular paper that has that was cited over like a thousand times. It was a paper in 2011. So they they basically apply this technique, which um, and given them like very, very uh, enables their model to achieve like to, to to have a very, very big memory. So that's kind of the gist of it. Um, is there anything else in the mention? Yeah, I think that's it.
Who is next? I'll call it. Okay, so the second paper I want to talk about today is Universal Language Model Fine-Tuning for Text Classification. And what this paper basically talks about is transfer learning, but rather for computer vision, which is the main application of transfer learning we've seen with ResNet, LeanNet. We're actually seeing this transfer learning for NLP models. And what this model shows is that we can use transfer learning to achieve performance 18 to 24 percent better than the state of the art with less than 1% of the training data they used for the state-of-the-art models. And how this improves upon previously, previous transfer learning uh, attempts is that previous transfer learning used um, inductive transfer learning. And this is basically just uh, cha uh, training the last couple or last layer of the model. However, this proposes that that actually doesn't work because it causes a bunch of overfitting. and um, proposes a couple techniques, being uh, van and, um, freezing gradients um, and triangular, triangular uh, learning rates. And I haven't looked too deep into these techniques, but it shows that these techniques are able to greatly improve the performance of transfer learning. And uh, the authors, Jeremy Howard and Sebastian Rudder, um, I believe Jeremy is uh, one of the guys behind Fast AI. And they were proposing that this model can be used for uh, several applications uh, beyond uh, classification, of one of which is that since it requ doesn't require that much training data, we can use it for text classification for uh, languages that aren't popular and being able to classify them with little, tra with little training data and other tasks that require little training data as well. And it's interesting to see where this will go since it's really novel and has achieved great performance beyond what we thought was imaginable. And yeah, thank you. Okay, um, so I saw this paper presented at CVPR this year. Um, there were too many people, so I couldn't get a chance to go actually see the poster. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to see if we can present it in uh, AIC, uh, mainly because I want to understand how this works and what it means. Um, so the, the problem that they are trying or they're trying to address is um, now we have seen a lot of uh, adversarial networks that can like change a few pixels in an image and then be able to sh uh, fool um, highly gen highly general networks or like networks that per do pretty well. Um, also, they have they've seen people have shown that you can fool networks to have high confidence in training data that are not similar. Sorry high confidence in data that is not similar to your training data. So model thinks it actually is very confident about the predictions it's making and is extremely wrong. And this data is actually very, very dissimilar to your original um, distribution. And that's something we don't want. The, I, the underlying premise of this entire thing is right now, uh, all the kinds of neural networks that we train, uh, the way we uh, enforce loss or errors is basically trying to make sure you don't get things wrong. So it's basically saying, I don't know what I, it basically tries to reduce what you don't know. Uh, the, the kind of uh, approach that they're trying to bring here or trying to address here is uh, the second level of ignorance that we talk about, which is um, you need to know what you don't know. So if you don't know something, at least don't be overconfident about what you don't know. Um, and they actually have a lemma that they prove where they say that if, if the network is predominantly with activations that are ReLU, or um, there's another ReLU kind, I don't know, linear? I don't know, some, some other. 
I don't know, some some activation function. Sorry? Leaky rel, yeah, yeah, sorry. So they're saying that uh, if your network is completely based on relu or leaky relu kind of functions, which lead to a learning that is a piecewise linear, what if you if your model ends up learning a piecewise linear function, then it applies this this lemma applies to all those models. And they actually decompose the layers, uh, including convolution layers, max polling layers, uh, and softmax layers, to make it a continuous linear function, continuous linear piecewise function. Uh, once they create that uh, expression, then they're able to prove that for any given epsilon, you can actually find training samples that are very far away from your original distribution and make the model, or find such samples where the model will be highly confident for those samples. Uh, when they say far away, it means any sample that is not part of your original distribution. So something that's extremely irrelevant, but it's going to be very confident in these things. And they can they prove that with some um, mild conditions. Um, and so that's, that, that's kind of bumming. Uh, what they do in the second half of the paper then is uh, propose how we can address this problem. So two ways to go about it. First one is to have generative models that create uh, in-sample data and try to force your network to learn um, better confidences over the data that you already know about, or create out-of-sample data and then do the adversarial kind of thing. So uh, you force it to then also recognize what is out-of-sample data. Um, and what they do actually is the third approach that they propose, which is trying to enforce this in the, in the training loss. And so they actually have a generative model or adversarial network that creates out of sample data for them. And the loss for those uh, predictions is taken into account in your training losses. Uh, and that's how they train. And, and that then makes the network, if, if it's a good network, then it's going to, or if it's a good model, then it's going to learn those weights for out of sample data to be very low. That's it's trying to minimize that error. Uh, and then they show the performance of. Uh, Google, Google Net and ResNet on MNIST, CIFAR, all the image data sets, and show that the performance doesn't drop when you use this kind of training. And that, yeah, basically saying that it also doesn't get fooled by auto-sample data. Um, yeah, questions? Hi everyone. Um, so, um, is there anyone who doesn't know what dropout is? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. So, um, the idea behind this paper is that it's actually a generalization of dropout. Um, we know that when we want to use dropout uh, to regularize the network, what we do is that we randomly se select some of the activations and then set them to zero at each in it at each training uh, step. Uh, the idea behind this paper is that um, instead of uh, setting the activated activations, activations to zero, I can set the weights to zero, which means I can actually um, change the structure of the network each time. <coughs> and uh, that, would, that would be a generalization to drop out. Um, what they do, what they do in this paper is that they first uh, show, they first find bounds for um, generalization performance of uh, both dropout and drop connect and show that drop connect is comparable with dropout. And then perform um, a number of experiments on like known um, uh, data sets, including MNIST and other uh, image classification data sets, and show that um, <clears throat> the performance of uh, drop connect is comparable with dropout and sometimes even better. Um, the problem is that it's not easy to implement. So um, I wasn't, unfortunately, I wasn't able to go through the details of this paper. But uh, to be able to uh, implement this paper, they had they came up with a lot of hacks on, on how to select the batch size and these kind of things. Um, I had some notes. I don't want to forget. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I just wanted to say that the perform performance is sometimes slower than other regularization methods. Um, and that's it. Yeah.
here. Hello, everyone. My name is Masood, as you can see. Um, so um, I was talking to Jian and uh, Amir about this paper. This is ResNet paper, a very a well-known paper, which uh, I guess till now has about 25,000 citations. And I checked out the repository of uh, ACE, and I saw that as a foundational paper, we haven't yet uh, covered this. And I guess there are a lot of good information in this paper that can be covered and uh, a lot of good insights that we can get from uh, presenting this paper and talking about it maybe in discussions uh, we can come up with another ideas in order to follow up on that and um, so basically what uh, this paper is talking about is that when we are trying to learn uh, the let's say a mapping from input to output let's call it hx x is our input and h is the representation that we want to find with training uh, on any data set so this edge uh, is our holy grail in order to find it. So it's a local minima or global uh, minima, hopefully. But um, they are talking about, um, let's change this and uh, let's uh, represent something else in our network and train on that. So um, the whole idea and the reason that they're doing that is um, the deeper the network goes, uh, usually when we have our deep uh, neural network, the deeper the network goes, it's harder to train, and uh, their training error increases with uh, increasing layer numbers. So let's say we have a neural network with like 20 layers on a training data set. So uh, the scope, like uh, the training error goes down, right? If we add 10 different layers, 10 more layers and add that to it, it would be 30 layers, right? But uh, ironically, the training error, instead of decreasing, it increases, and it's not it's not overfitting, right? It's, if, if it was overfitting, we would have like a less amount of error. So what's happening here? They their hypothesis their, their hypothesis is that uh, maybe our optimization algorithms are not sufficient enough in order to learn those extra parameters. Because in in worst case, let's say we have our 20 layers. And then we add 10 layers to that, right? So these 10 layers, let's call them just uh, identity mapping, like nothing. There's no information in them. So they should work as good as the 20 layers, right? But somehow, our optimization process cannot even learn that this is identity. So what they're trying to um, uh, optimize on and trying to find uh, that uh, mapping instead of hx which I talked about they say let's uh, let's um, define a new mapping which is called fx and fx equals hx minus x so in different blocks that we have so hx minus the input of h right so it would be the residual of what is coming in the block of learning and what is the output, which is hx. So hx minus x would be fx, right? So let's try to learn this, this residual information that is coming through the network and we're learning it. And based on that, they uh, they were able to uh, win uh, IL, uh, SC, uh, VRC, uh, like um, uh, for ImageNet dataset classification, Coco dataset, they have, like uh, at that year, they had all the uh, state-of-the-art um, uh, performances on Coco, on uh, Cypher, on uh, ImageNet, and they, uh, they won the whole uh, competition, basically. And uh, as I said, in 2018, as uh, uh, he uh, talked about in his personal website in 2018 it was uh, the most cited paper in whole uh, like areas and uh, so I thought maybe it's a good idea in order to recap on that maybe a lot of you know about it but I, I thought maybe it's a good idea to talk about it thank you Right, uh, I think that's all. Um, yeah, that's it. We can stop the live stream. Thanks, online people, for joining us. We're going to cut you out now. <laughs>